The following presentation is from the September 2nd Sierra Republican Club Luncheon. Our guest speaker is Congressman Mark Amaday, with a special tribute to the 13 fallen service members who fell on August 27th in Kabul, Afghanistan from a terrorist attack. Thank you, Ray. With that, dear Lord, thank you for peace. But remember those that are fighting the war to keep that peace and those that have passed. Thank you for our health, but remember those that are sick. Thank you for the food that will be before us, but please remember those that are hungry. And thank you for all those first responders that are out there, for us that have homes, remember those homes that are at risk, and do what we can to help those that have lost. Amen. Thank you, Senator. The next person, oh, there he is. There's is the Pledge of Allegiance, Gary Nielsen. By the way, Gary is the one that donated two dozen of red roses, which we'll be getting into about the 13, the fallen soldiers plate. Thank you. <clears throat> I think everybody should come up and take a look at this table, too, because um, the symbolism is really important. Anyway. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Gary. Next, I'm really proud of this situation. It's between the Atlantis idea of Senator Settlemeyer, and we put this together in three days. I want you at the end of the meeting to come up and see the symbolism. But first, Dale Stockton, that's with Battleborn Veterans, is going to go through the procedure and the table. They did an excellent job, and like I said, uh, Senator Settlemeyer provided the flags, Gary provided the uh, roses, and the Atlantis did all the rest of the work. Dale? Senator Settlemeyer? Okay. Jim, please. Thank you. The Fallen Soldiers Table. This table is to honor those who have served and those currently serving in the uniformed services of the United States. That they are mindful and that they are aware of the sweetness of enduring peace and always with being aware of the taintness and the, the bitterness of personal sacrifice. We are compelled to never forget that while we enjoy our daily pleasures, there are others who are enduring or maybe still enduring agonies and pains. We call your attention to the one table which occupies a place of dignity and honor in the room. The tablecloth is white, which signifies the purity of the ones defending our nation and the response to, their, to our nation's call to arms. There's a single red rose in the vase. This signifies the love from families and loved ones, in addition to the love of our country for the blood they have shed for us. The yellow ribbon tied so prominently around a vase is a reminder of the families and loved ones of our fellow service members who have so fondly kept their memory alive, lest we forget, let us remember. The slice of lemon on the plate reminds us of the bitter fate that they have suffered at the hands of our country's enemies. Let us remember. The salt on the plate represents the countless tears of their families, friends, loved ones, and their country that await for their return. Let us remember. The glass is inverted.
because of their fate, they cannot drink and partake with us today. Let us remember. The United States flag and the candle on the center of the table symbolizes the valor and purity of those comrades who fought valiantly for this nation. Let us remember. The lighting of the candle. Symbolizes our never ending struggle to secure our freedom and account for our fallen brothers and sisters. Let us remember. The chair is empty. For they are not here, for wars are not won, nor freedom endured by the living alone. Let us remember. Let us not forget the sacrifices of those brave men and women and their families. Ladies and gentlemen, please join us in honoring our fallen. Raise your glasses, but refrain from taking a drink. For our brothers and sisters cannot partake with us. Let us remember. Salute. I think they did a beautiful job. And at the end, please come up, take pictures. I know that KOH had me on yesterday. They were so interested in this memorial to them. Go ahead and do the video. Today there's things disappearing That I worked for all my life I dread having to start again With just my children and my wife I want to thank some lucky stars For trying to bring our greatness back today Cause the flag used to stand for freedom Now they're trying to take that away We're gonna make America great again We're gonna set our country free From the destruction by the party Taking freedom right away right from okay. me And I'll proudly stand up Next to Trump we and support him here to today Cause there ain't no doubt to let it shine this land. As an example, we God bless Trump and the USA We will make America America strong again. We will make America safe again. We will make America great again. With the fine folks of Minnesota to the great peeps of Tennessee, along with the strong down in Texas, from sea to shining sea, from the suffering Detroit down to Houston. We can bring back the American dream And it's time we stand and say We're gonna make America great again We're gonna keep our country free And we're going to help all those who fought To give that right to me And I'll gladly stand up next to Trump And support him here today Look at this. Just before midnight, Major General Christopher Donahue, with the 82nd Airborne, became the last soldier out of Afghanistan. Minutes after the last C-17 took off from Kabul, the Taliban celebrated. There were fireworks and gunshots. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken says fewer than 200 Americans have been left behind. Fox has been talking to some of them. They're terrified. Here at home, there is mounting fury. 
90 former generals and admirals have signed a letter demanding the resignation of Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and the chair of the Joint Chiefs, Mark Milley. Republicans are sharply critical of the president's leadership. Senator Tom Cotton says Biden kept promises to the Taliban, but we not to America. We keeping Americans. Bagram because of its relationship, its location to China. Hmm. This is a $10 billion base that they built over years, and uh, it's there, it's built, well, and it's near, it's, it's in a perfect, perfect territory for us to have as an outpost. I signed a deal. We signed a deal that was conditions-based. Everything was conditioned. And by the way, they didn't fulfill some of Everybody those conditions. Our military has been LA. humiliated. Our country has been humiliated by the way they get, got out. The withdrawal was a disaster. And we, it looked like they would not look like. They told us to get out. They gave us a date, and that was it. That withdrawal was an absolute humiliation. To Republicans, Democrats, everybody across the state, across the country getting organized, and that means there, there's some new blood out there. A new organization formed called Red Move Nevada. And the co-executive director, uh, Ray Roca, is with us th- this afternoon on News Talk 780 KH. Hi, Ray. Great to catch up with you, sir. Hi, Dan. How you doing? I'm doing, uh, I'm doing okay. So um, what you've got going on here is um, tomorrow uh, at the Atlantis at 11 right. o'clock, you got a little, little lunch. you got Congressman Amade there to speak. When the going gets tough, they will not be there. Where are the patents? Where are the Eisenhowers? Where are the Bradleys? Where are the MacArthur's? They're all gone. We don't have any out there. They were out there. And they are out there. And you will be out there. And if there's any doubt in anybody's mind, or was any doubt in anybody's mind, there sure as hell isn't any doubt now. The hell with the Senate. Believe it. Believe it, believe it, believe it, because you must believe it. If you are going to be a leader of the 21st century. Today there's things... All right, I love the music, and I love the video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. With that, with that in mind, I'm going to go around and introduce people. The first is my daughter, Chris Kelly. Stand up, Chris. She just got promoted to the head of Radon for the state of Nevada through the university. Next is Assemblyman Jim Wheeler, and I believe he's going to run for Senate. Next is Eddie Floyd. He, he's the founder and does the program America Media Matters, right? Close enough. Or America, American Matters Media. Senator Settlemeyer that's helped out, and it was his idea. Matt Bueller is running for Secretary of State. May Herbert, she's in everything worse than me. But she's ambassador, the um, ambassadors club that she's sponsored, and she's also representative as uh, for Taiwan. And her daughter that came all the way from Ireland is here. Both stand up. Next person is Scott Hohen. He's the chair, 
I said it right. Chairman of the Carson City Republican Party. Everybody is important. Mike Clark is the current assessor. Can't see everybody here. Oh, Ken Cappy is like an old fixture. <laughs> Patty Miller was the ex treasurer in the past, former for the Washoe GOP. Stand up, Patty. Patty Caffaretta is the first woman treasurer for the state of Nevada. I just want to introduce one person, too. Chairman of the Republican Central Committee for Stanislaus Forever, Jim D. Martini and Supervisor. Good guy, Jim. John Kerry is the current vice chairman of the Washoe GOP. Tom Heck is running for governor. You'll be hearing from each of them for two minute speeches. Anyway, Dr. Fred Simon is running for governor. Danny Tarkarian is the Douglas County Commissioner. Stand up, Danny. Jan Glazzini is the cur uh, current clerk for Washoe County. Anna's running again. You'll hear from her. Charisse, Dr. Sharice Chavez is the Washoe Chairman for Precinct. She needs more people to sign up for precinct position, because it all starts with the precinct and you work your way up. So see her, she's looking for people. Anyway, Carolyn Smith is running, is running for the Women's Federation president, and she's been in so damn many things, but anyway. Cameron Hawkins is running for Lieutenant Governor. Sandy Masters is the founder of Mount Rose Republican Women and head of the Women's Pack. Chris Dare is running for Secretary of State and he's current Spark City Councilman. But the real brains is T here. Now, the last individual, I hope I haven't missed anybody, is Martin Koniak and his wife. Martin has quite a distinctive career. He moved down from Washington a couple of years ago and he happens to live at our gated community at Toscana and puts up with me. Um, he spent the last year writing a book that's fabulous. He's going to be at the back there at the end. And Martin and his wife, Lorraine, it's called Losing America. It's well written. He spent a year on it. Talk to him at the back table. They're available for sale. Thank you, Martin. And with that in mind, did I miss anybody? I hope not. Everybody is important. With that in mind, the next thing we're doing is the candidates. Two-minute talk. If the candidates would all come to the front, he'll post you where you're supposed to stand.
We'll start with governor's candidates first. Governor's candidates, then lieutenant governor, secretary of, Matt, secretary of state, Jim. Jan? Where's Jan Glissini? Oh. Any word from Huh? I know. He's always late. He'll wring his neck. You ready? We'll start with... Uh, She's Claudia's timer. And by the way, Claudia here, if you look when you're speaking, will put up one minute on the yellow. The uh, green, well, the red means you're done. Get off stage. And with that in mind, the first candidate for governor is Dr. Simon. And he's also a trauma surgeon and owns a restaurant. Western Dion in Gardnerville. Christopher's. Italian. Christopher's. Oh, Christopher's. Okay. Anyway, you're on. Okay. I'm going to answer the question. What's the difference between Republicans and Democrats? Democrats are ideologists. All they do is see one thing. Control power. Republicans are democratic. We don't want to just control power. We want to be collaborative. Democrats usurp power and extort power and they don't believe in power at the local level. Republicans believe in power at the local level. You can just see what's happening in Nevada. Sisolak is extorting power in particular looking at the school boards. He's got the money and he's demanding whatever he wants. Republicans are collaborative. Democrats try and separate Americans. Republicans have discussion among themselves, and that's why sometimes we don't all agree. Democrats follow the ideology like sheep. Republicans believe in goodness and a higher authority. Democrats believe in higher government. And last but not least, Republicans believe in goodness and faith and getting along, and Democrats believe in punishment. Democrats are evil, and Republicans are good people of a higher authority. Hi, I'm Tom Heck, and I'm running for governor in this great state. Uh, but I got to take a few seconds to talk about and something dear, dear to my heart, you know, what's going on in Afghanistan. I was a contingency war planner for eight of my 23 years. I know how this is supposed to have gone down. We abandoned Bagram Air Force, which is the only defendable area to make this go smoothly. And the second piece that most people don't get is that this planning goes on for every possible uh, outcome. And there were plans on the shelf that said what they would do. And, it's called, and what they use is a time phase force deployment list which determine who needs to leave first, who's no longer needed, what equipment needs to leave, and it should have been a very smooth transition. I want you all to know this, that this is very, very poorly done, actually a failure. But the piece that I remember is that I grew up in the time of warriors. Warriors killed people and broke things. Today, the military is the time of diversity, and it is very, very disgusting that pilots talk about the fact they spend more time doing diversity training than flying. Now. I want to talk about, as the title is, Democrats and Republicans. What's the difference? For all of you, how many of you read Hillary's America or, or seen the movie? I would all encourage all of you to watch Hillary's America. It basically talks about things I didn't even know about, that basically the Republican Party is the party of minorities. And that's the way it was founded. It was founded back in the, in the Civil War era. Democrats are driven by the vocal minority, not, not a democracy where it's driven by the majority. They need victims and they need control. That's unacceptable and we ought to be fighting hard. The problem is um, 
There's an, also a YouTube video that talks about specifically the difference in Democrats and Republicans. And what they describe it as is very simple. Republicans want to do things that work and make things better. Democrats want to do things that make people feel good. And you've got to remember this, and, and everything you look at, put that in that perspective. Why did they like Obama? Because he made people feel good. Why did they dislike Trump? Because he created conflict and forced people to do what they needed to do. We are at war with Marxism, and it's time to get tough. We need a strong leader. I'm Tom Heck. I'm running for governor in this great state. Vote for someone tough, strong, and ready to take on the hard issues. Thank you very much. See thomasheck.org. Thank you. Wow, listen to these uh, candidates for governor. Um, on my website, voteforhawkins.com, it actually said, who is the lieutenant governor? Who is the lieutenant governor? We had a great gun show. I do a lot of gun shows in the state. Had a great gun show in Virginia City. And it dawned upon me, if people don't know who the lieutenant governor is, they may not know who's running for lieutenant governor. Well, I'm running for lieutenant governor. And my name is Cam Cameron Hawkins. And by the way, did you all know our lieutenant governor left our state? Anybody in this room? Know that, yeah, two, three of you? Yeah, we don't have a lieutenant governor now. This person actually did not uphold her duty. Uh, I'm here today simply because of my brothers and sisters. Who in here owns a firearm? Good, you're my brothers and sisters. Who in here is a veteran like myself? Thank you, and thank all of you that for supporting us. We lost some good men and women, but we're always going to lose good men and women because we're always going to breed good men and women in this nation. That's what I believe about. Now, for me, it's real simple. I'm already in media. It's good to see Mr. Floyd over there. Good to see Eddie. Um, these are a couple of my magazines. We have seven magazines in this state. They're all about tourism. They're back there by the banner. And it was real easy for me as a kid. I could walk up to another kid and go, you're a Democrat. And they're like, why? I said, because you're just bossing everybody around. And you're not doing anything. You just went trying to take charge, and I don't really care what the outcome is. And when I was a little kid, I'd see a little kid, I'd say, you're a Republican. Well, why am I a Republican? Because it doesn't matter who gets the glory when you get the job done. Does anyone ever believe in that? The concept is we get the job done here in America. And that's the key. And I'm proud to be here with my brothers and sisters. Anything you need to know about what I'm doing, I'm just running for lieutenant governor. Got some golf tournaments coming up. Scott, proud that you're here with uh, Carson. Valley, we're actually giving donates, uh, donating 10% uh, of the Genoa Golf Classic to, to that Republican group. And we'll, we'll do this throughout the state. We have a lot of things going on. I'm just happy to be here. But wow, those, uh, well, actually, before everyone applauds, where, where's Bill? There he is. Where's Ray? Thank you guys for making this happen. I'm happy to be a founding member of this group. And if you're new here, welcome. Thank you again. Cameron Hawkins, Hawkins for Nevada. Vote for Hawkins.com. Good afternoon. I'm Matt Bueller, and like Tom Heck, I am a career veteran of the United States Air Force. I served 22 years on active duty, and I've been a Nevada resident for the last 25 years. So in my assignments, actually 12 years total in Nevada, I've made friends in southern Nevada at Nellis. I've worked at Classified Location, Las Vegas, and I was actually lucky enough to go to school at UNR, uh, and then go teach at the Air Force Academy. So um, after writing that proverbial blank check for my career, uh, I wanted to not only defend the right to vote, but I want to now come in here and ensure that Nevada's vote is protected. So that, that's my motivation for, for running for Secretary of State. It's the most important job. We need to ensure the integrity of our vote. The difference between Dems and Republicans, okay? Democrats want to have everything at a high level, centralized government, take care of uh, problems with big government. Republicans want to push it down to the local level, and they want to solve problems at the individual level. They want people to basically be able to self-govern, solve their own problems. Now, full disclosure, I grew up as a Southern Democrat, and... I uh, was a Democrat up until about a year and a half ago. I ran for Washoe County Treasurer, and I got 85,000 votes. I uh, did not win, obviously. Um, but after I got pushed out for being a conservative in the party, 
I decided I need to come over here. So I am a true and true Republican, and um, I am, you can be sure of one thing, I am not a Harry Reid Republican, like some of the people in the party. I am for conservative values, and I want to ensure that conservative values are uh, promoted throughout our state. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Christopher Dare. I'm running for Secretary of State. I currently serve you as City Councilman of, of the City of Sparks, but also on a lot of boards. So one of the things I just share is if you ever really want to see what I'm going to do, just watch what I do now, because I serve you now on a lot of boards in the community, and so you can see how we function. And if you like what I do, then that's what I'll do. Republican. So for me, it has to do with principles, has to do with values. So I think back to when I was about... I was young, I was in junior high, and Reagan was the president. And I remember that's when I started paying attention to things. I started watching and I started figuring out who I wanted to be, and that's something my parents were, but I wanted to make sure it was mine. So as we grew older, I watched as it would seem Republicans would get in office and bring a balance back to the equation of whatever happened when the Democrats were in. And I didn't understand it as a young man, I just knew there was something very, very different, and it's what I wanted. Now for me, fast forward to today, it has still to do with principles and values. We, we talk about very much sanctity of life. We talk about different things like that. I'm one that believes every life is valuable. I've been a pastor for 30 years, and I will continue to believe that. Um, one of that means I do believe Democrats' lives are valuable as well because I get to pastor all of them. However, it does not mean that we all come to the table with the same equation. We don't all come to the same, same decisions all the time. When it comes to principles of who we are, I do believe America is an amazing country. I've traveled to about 40 different countries doing a lot of work, and so I know firsthand how amazing our country is. This is obviously not what we want to see. So when it comes to the difference between us and them, one of the things that I, I do see, I serve currently a lot with homeless. As a pastor, I've done that, but also as, as a, uh, one, one of your people who serve in our community. I'm one who strongly believes that it does not help to come in and give away everything and expect people to, to grow and become who they should be. I think as Republicans, I've always learned that we need to make a stand, teach people, require things of people, but I agree that it's a local level. As a city councilman, I've loved serving on the local level, and I'm honored to say hi to you today. I hope you have a great day. Thank you. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jim Wheeler, and I'll be running for the state senate in I don't know what district. Okay. But it will be for Senator Settlemeyer's seat because we only live about a mile apart, and he is termed out. So I'm going to be the guy that's going for that. But um, what I wanted to say to you today, it's not going to be me that changes this state. It's not going to be any of these governor candidates that change this state. It's not going to be any lieutenant governor, et cetera. It's going to be you. You are the ones who have to change this state. We have to get together and look at what has happened over the last seven months federally and over the last two and a half years here in this state and say we're tired of it. We've got to stand up and be counted. We cannot just let them run over the top of us, cancel us, etc. Stand up, be counted, be yourselves, and let's start being the opposition instead of being the actual uh, minority. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Wow, going last after all those great speakers and the only female up here. <laughs> so, um, Republican, Democrat in my position as county clerk don't matter. We're there to serve the public and in an unbiased way. The last five county clerks have all been Republican and they've all been women. So I would like to make it, you know, the next four years remains a, a woman in the Republican Party. Um, I don't know what else to say. Jan Galassini for Washoe County Clerk. <laughs> There was one other candidate I couldn't, was planning to make it, 
but couldn't today. Lorna Quisenberry is running for assessor. She had an emergency, couldn't attend. And the lady doing, keeping these guys on track, she's a good timer. Cla yeah, she gave you the eye. Claudia Fisher is one of our founding mem members. Stand up, Claudia. And with that in mind, we're almost right on schedule. I'll introduce our congressman for number two, if they keep it as number two or whatever they're doing. Um, congressman Amade, his chief of staff for Nevada is Stacy Paravic. I said it right, stand up. And with that in mind, our current and forever congressman, Mark Amaday. Thanks. Thank you, Ray. Um, since there are apparently multiple individuals in attendance at, at the club day to today, Ray, that are, uh, that are, they can't hear me. You want me to be six inches shorter? Does this come up? Or? How's it work now? Hey. Thank you. What are your questions? That concludes my presentation. I, I just wanted to let all of you, all of you know that, that, that for future purposes, please feel free to call Stacy, who was introduced, and say, what time is it that you're scheduled to arrive since I was on time for my noon arrival? And apparently I was 10 minutes early. But for those of you who think it's going to be yet another Amaday no-show, I'd like to know which ones there were, please feel free to inquire in that context. And, and we'll, we'll endeavor to make sure that everything goes OK. Um, Ray, when do you want me to be when do you want me to be done? Because since I was on time, I want to stay on time. Um, but first of all, I want to do this. Ray. God, I was afraid you weren't going to make it. Thank God you're here. First of all, I want to say thank you for what you do. I want to say thank you for this club and the effort you put in. Thank you for the fact that you were there at the beginning till the end and all the stuff in terms of at, at Republican Trump headquarters and that sort of stuff. And so I have a check here for the Sierra Nevada GOP club for you guys to do whatever you darn well please with from my campaign. Thank you very much, Ray. Thank you, Congressman. We appreciate it. Um, so I, um, I, I, when I got here early, um, I, I'm listening. You to have some... to talk for at least thirty minutes. <laughs> yeah, that, that'll be that'll be a first. Um, but, but what I was when I'm looking at this, like, okay, what's Ray want me to do? I'll tell you what we've got on the calendar, other than when we were supposed to arrive. Um, it's how to turn the country Republican, um, and then what's going on in D.C., which would make everybody suicidal. But we'll touch on that. Um, but, but let's, let's talk about, because it kind of goes with, with the candidates that, that were here, or let me put it to you this way. If it's possible to be a candidate six months before sign up, wh whatever it is, um, since I expect in this business six months is a long time. So w we'll see how that goes. But how to turn the country Republican again? Um, I, I want to start here at home. I mean, uh, obviously, I don't have the solution to the country. There's other states and other metropolitan areas and other D strongholds and R strongholds and I strongholds, so what, whatever. But let's start here at home, because we're a reflection of what's going on in a lot of places. And by the way, nobody leave the room and say this is a blame thing. I mean, let's just take an honest look in the mirror. You want to turn the, the, the country R again? Then regardless of who you're going to vote for in any primary election, for instance, here in Washoe County, maybe we ought to talk about how we need to figure out a way to come together as a political team after primaries and elect Republicans. Donald Trump lost Washoe County by 10,000 votes, okay? 
And, and, and listen, I'm, I'm just, there are plenty of reasons for that. Nobody here is interested in why or how or whatever. Everybody's got their opinions, and they're not going to be swayed by other people's. Let's move on. If you want to talk about how you're going to have a Republican governor in this state that is registered D and Washoe's a 50-50 thing, and by the way, Mike Cadnazzi's doing a great job. So I don't know if Mike's here or whatever. Nobody leave the room and say, but it's like, guess what? Top of the ticket races this time. United States Senator and Governor of the state of Nevada. Do we really need to spend a lot of time talking about no matter what, we better come together after the primary. Now let me tell you a story, and it makes fun of nobody but me, so if you want to be offended by this story, please feel free to ask Ray for your money back for lunch. The 2016 presidential Republican side of the cycle had a few people in the primary. Remember that? We had a football team and probably half another team for substitutes. Amade, I'm a Bush guy. Okay, now it's your guy's turn to go, oh, you rotten, dirty, no good. Because that's what we do to ourselves. And so then it's like, okay, Bush goes away. I get calls from those two rotten, bad advice Republicans in the House at the time, Trey Gowdy and uh, Jason Chaffetz. Hey, you really need to be with Rubio. He wants you, blah, blah, blah. He needs a good... Uh, and, and, and by the way, we think he's going to be the vice presidential guy because Trump hasn't said anything bad about him. He said stuff bad about all the other folks, but he hasn't. So they're pals. You should get on that bandwagon. Okay. You know, I want to play. Okay. Thanks, Jeb Bush, for the memories. Go, Rubio. Go down to Minden to the thing he had down there and no thing across the street here. He had a, th a thing there, too. And it was like, okay, this is all great. What was it? Ten days later, they're talking about what hand size is an indicator of? <laughs> That's how well that went. Why am I telling you this story? Because after two, 0 for 2, I said... Please listen to these words and either disregard them or think about them when you leave lunch. I give up picking the winner. I will support whoever the nominee is for president on the Republican ticket. I will support whoever the nominee is. But you don't want me to pick anybody else because clearly anybody I pick is dead in the water within a relatively short amount of time. So I will support whoever the nominee is. And so, and, and by the way, that means I don't care if the Billy Bush thing comes out. I don't care if there's BS impeachments. I don't care any of that stuff. I will support my nominee and I will support the head of our team when they're elected. Now, I know, I mean, I mean trust me, we're all guilty of it. It's like, well, I don't like this or I heard that. That's fine. Th that's never going to stop. But if we, if we don't stop the we have met the enemy and it is us, and I'll be honest with you folks, you say, you know, you're talking in kind of an aggressive tone. It's like, I'm worried, boys and girls. Guess what? We're going to have some people who are passionate about running as Republicans in primaries, and they have every right to be. And you have every right to select whoever you want and support them. But when they've won that election, you need to get behind them. You can't go home and expect to do well. This is a 50-50 county, Republicans and Democrats. Don't forget the independents, because thanks to DMV, there's a bunch of them. They're the number two registered group in Clark County. Anybody hear of that place? It's somewhere south of Tonopah. So when you talk about, oh, the D's got this big advantage, it's like, well, any consultants that are out there, don't forget the independents. They tend to vote, and by the way, in a 50-50 county, I would think we wouldn't have to go farther down that decision line. But I, I just want you to think about the concept of I'm passionate about my governor candidate. I'm passionate about my U.S. Senate candidate. I'm passionate about the other statewide offices, the legislative offices. Great. Nothing wrong with that. But if your passion then translates to my girl didn't get elected. My guy didn't get elected. We've met the enemy, and it's us. Hope I'm wrong, but it's like, how, let's start at home. 
I want to remind you of a couple other things, that, because we tend to, you know, the political history line is about this long, and you're going, wait a minute. Let's just not forget what happened in 2020. Donald Trump left the 15 rural counties in Nevada with a 75,000 vote lead. Now, they represent, Patty, what do they represent? 15, 17% of the state's population? A 75,000 vote lead. You want to talk about governor? You want to talk about Senate? You want to talk about control in the legislature? You want to talk about any of that stuff? Because I'm, I'm listening when I got here to, I mean, listen, this is not exactly, well, let's see what people think at Ray's meeting about the Second Amendment. We're not sure where they're at on that. Let's see what they think about the border. Come on. We all know the talking points. You can get them every morning and every evening and all day long on the whatever. Let's talk about how, who didn't turn out. Let's talk about how we can get them to turn out. Let's talk about who's unregistered. It's not sex and violence. And, and the consultants don't make a lot of, they don't make a lot of money doing this stuff. But at the end of the day, oh, and by the way, anybody want to tell me about all the election fraud that happened in those 15 counties where we won by 75,000 votes? Not talking about Clark County. That's another story entirely, but I am sick and tired of hearing national people say Nevada has a big problem with its voter integrity process. 75,000 vote victory across 15 counties is not election fraud, Republicans. And you say, oh, that's, that's full of it. You're full of it. Okay, I'm full of it. Just, just tell me. I won by 60,000. Oh, the integrity of the election sucks. I demand a recount. Do we need help in that stuff? Yeah, we absolutely do. Where you, get a, where you get a ballot you didn't ask for and mail it in and nobody even knows who that you are? Yeah. You want to know what the quickest way to that is? Elect a Republican governor who knows how the state works. Not telling you who that is. You need somebody who can go interact with leadership in Las Vegas in the legislature and go, you like your budget? Guess what? Not a darn thing's happening until we put, you want mail-in balloting, that's fine. Here's the safety mechanism. You got to show up and do something to get one and to have it counted. It wasn't like we were the paragon of, listen, I, I'm, I'm not going to tell you guys how old I am because I'm really young. But I registered to vote in Nevada when I was 18 years old. In order to do that, you had to, I don't even remember it so long ago, but I know you had to sign your name. And so when you're an old person like me and you show up to vote early or in person or ask for an absentee ballot, you have to sign something. Now, let's not kid ourselves. There are no county clerks or election officials that are handwriting experts. And, and by the way, we now know there are no machines that are handwriting experts as well. But that notwithstanding, it wasn't like we were the high bar. I, had to, I have to stand in front of the Carson City clerk, and they go, sign here. And you're like, and I look at the old signature, and I'm going, uh-oh. So I sign, and they look at it and go, okay, good enough. Now, that's hardly like brusting into Fort Knox, but at least somebody had to stand in front of somebody as opposed to, well, here's all the mail thing, and we've got 30,000 votes through the mail today, and the, and the clerk's office was empty. So it's not like it's a tall thing, but you want to change it quick, it's like, guess what? None of this stuff is moving forward. You want to do mail-in to increase turnout? Good idea. You got to have some safety stuff. in there. My humble opinion. How do you get that done? Quite frankly, the person who sits at the apex of those crossroads is the person who can get it done quick enough, and that's called the governor of the state of Nevada. Not the senator, not the congress member, not the legislature or whatever, because guess what? There's plenty of work to be done there, but, but, but we were trying to do that work when I was there. Now, when I was there, we were in the majority for most of that time, but not all of it, and that comes and it goes. You want instant gratification? You better get behind whoever the, whoever the primary winner is. Just food for thought. You want, you want 
You want somebody other than Chuck Schumer to be in charge of the Senate? Well, guess what? You got a chance to do something about that. Better get behind whoever the primary winner is. That's all, I, I, I'm, I'm just saying, and if you don't, that's fine too. Everybody's big boys and girls, but guess what? If you don't, you get the government that basically wins the election. And we all know, I'm not gonna go into it a lot. I mean, God, it's, it's kind of like hoping that the air clears up. But, but anyhow, um, if anybody, I'll just say this, I don't think, you know, we have never done better than when the other side helps us out. And, and I'll just tell you this. In my humble opinion, Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, most of the network folks, a whole bunch of people on the internet have never worked harder to make Republicans look good in my memory. Have never worked harder to make Republicans look good in my memory. And so our challenge is, Let's reward their work with not being the biggest threat to our own success. Do I think we're the biggest threat to our own success? No. But I chose those words because, quite frankly, this is the opportunity to move out of the, well, I've got my group and my group and I've got my echo chamber and you've got yours and all this other sort of stuff. And guess what? If you keep doing the same thing, you'll keep getting the same results. And so Washoe County is an area where I look, and by the way, thank you, Washoe County. We've won it six times in a row. But it's not because we mailed something in or whatever. We work hard to get votes in Washoe County. And so I'll just tell you, it's like I'm not, there's no ax to grind here. Thank you very much for basically I think, hopefully, you think, doing your homework and, and voting for who you think would best represent you. But having said that, we need to re-examine what we do after a primary. And you say, well, why are you harping at us about that? It's all this far away. It's like, well, hell. It's just, just, from, just from the political circles right now, you'd think, you'd think early voting for the primary starts in two weeks. So I'm going to give you a long time to think about it, hopefully, or not. And let me just... Listen, what's happening in D.C., everybody okay, goes, well, how could they this, how could they that? It's like, let me try, tr try to make this, because it's part of how I keep my sanity, which I know some of you go, you're not keeping it, you lost it a long time ago. Having said that, it's like, listen, on the House, the side with the most votes wins. When it was John Boehner and, and Paul Ryan, it was like, you know, we got a constant stream of, um, and by the way, Barack Obama was the president for part of that. It's like, why are you doing these poison pill things, blah, blah, blah. They're never going to become law. Ladies and gentlemen, Nancy Pelosi's running the House, and the rules are there's no filibuster, there's no quorum call, there's no uh, cloiture, there's none of that. The side with the most votes wins. She's got a five-vote advantage. And by the way, those people said, that's going to be interesting. That's really going to be interesting because there's some, it's like, guess what? Sorry for you animal lovers in the crowd. Please plug your ears right now. But guess what? On January 3rd, she must have put a horse head in everybody's bed in her caucus because they haven't strayed this much. That five-vote thing has been ruthlessly enforced, even though there are Democrats who are moderate. So she's controlling that. You got Mitch and uh, Kamala, Camilla, Kawilla, pardon me, the vice president, running the Senate. And you've got whatever the heck's going on down there in the executive uh, office building and the, and, the, and the residence. You've got what, so it's like, you know, why don't you guys do something? It's like, ladies and gentlemen, not that anybody's, I, I mean, we're fully engaged. I, I guess, Ray, I owe you an apology. You know, we were doing stuff for fires and stuff for Afghanistan people who need help getting out and stuff for how do you see through smoke with, anyhow, you, you don't care about that. But anyhow, it's like, we're doing plenty. But if you want absolute accountability, you got to put a new team in, in Washington. And we're going to find out what this country is made out of, ladies and gentlemen, next year. And so even though in one sense it's six months away for signups, it's like we're going to find out. But make no mistake, this is a battle for common sense, fairness, transparency, 
and, and responsibility. Oh, by the way, here's a word that you're not going to hear a lot of. I hope you start hearing a lot more with people who can demonstrate it. The most underutilized word in politics for going on a, on a, on a decade now is leadership. And you say, well, there's leadership. It's like, no, what we've got is we've got talking point machines floating all over the place. Oh, the Second Amendment. It's like, what, what the hell? I mean, it's like, really? Who's opposed to the Bill of Rights? And I used to think it was just the Second Amendment, but apparently freedom of speech is not so much anymore because if you say the wrong thing, you get booted out of freedom of speech on the, on the social media. And I know you guys are addicted to it. Just do the best you can to treat your addict addiction. That's all I got to say. Not that there's not... I love shopping on it. It's a great... But, but it's like, really, the social media stuff, the stuff that's out there on everything is like, wow. Separating the wheat from the chaff is, is a job that, that, that is potentially a pretty big one. But... So when we talk, it's like, how about some leadership? How about somebody who's a, here's two words. Some of you may have to look them up. Problem solver. Problem solver. And you say, well, oh, well that, that's, it's like, no, no, no. Before you can be a problem solver, you have to take the time to, three words, identify the problem, which means you've got to step out of your talking point echo chamber and go, we don't like all the smoke. What the hell's the deal? You know, I've sworn two or three times, and I'm going to try to stop. Although I have, I have used much nicer words than I was using earlier in the day. You got to know what the problem is. You don't like smoke. It's like, well, let's talk about, here's a concept. Maybe the problem is we haven't looked at infrastructure as including the resource that surrounds every one of our communities. And so while we love to look at Lake Tahoe, we love to look at Hope Valley, we love to look at the eastern slope of the Sierra or the desert, it's like, hey, that needs some attention on a regular basis too in order for us to avoid scenarios where you basically, I'll tell you one of the things we're doing, I didn't take away from my arrival time today, Ray. It's like, we want to know what you've spent just on Tamarack and Calder. God forbid, Dixie. We want to know what you spent on that. And then we want to know what the fuels management budget is for the whole country. Because guess what? And, and by the way, that isn't going to be solved. But, but until you start respecting the stuff around our communities as infrastructure, then guess what? We're just going to continue to go. I hope that bridge doesn't fall down. It was built 50 years ago. And it's in a really rough area, and it looks like there's some cracks and stuff, but just keep driving. I think it'll be okay for another year. That's the way it is out here. You know, I, I mean, one of the things we're working on is, hey, Desert Research Institute, can you give us a burn scar map? Burn scars that are only five years old. You know why? Because when you're planning and, and you get some money to do this, you don't need to do that. I mean, heck, we had the ski season fires here in Reno. That was my name. I hope that isn't insensitive where we lost how many residences on the west side of town? In November. So it's not like, oh, yeah. It's, it's like, oh, my God, it's brilliant. I hope it doesn't. And, you know, and it's like, wow. Identify the problem and endeavor to solve it. Now, this is, a, this is a naive thought from an old person, but it's like, if you go to people and ask them for their support, candidates, candidates, then I, I just believe that if you can say, we have been effective in identifying problems that are of most importance to you and solving them instead of worrying who gets on TV most and how, what, what, it's like, you know, stranger things have happened. You might get people going, huh, maybe that works. So with that, I, I think I probably said too much. Um, I don't have... I don't have anything else. Uh, I don't have anything else beyond a couple of those things, which I'll remind you of, because you're going. You know, he, he talked and he yelled a lot, and and what did he say? It's like, let's please think about not being our own worst enemies after the primary. Let's think about how we change things to Republican means that Republicans get elected. Let's have some respect for our electoral process, where when the voters speak in a primary then it's like, you know what, I have to respect that result. I have to respect that result. Or 
If I choose not to, then don't come, then, then don't come say, what's the Republicans doing for me? It's like, what are you doing for the Republican? So, try to avoid talking point machines. What are you going to do about water? What are you going to do about air? What are you going to do about COVID? What are you going to do about masks? What are you going to do about shots? What are you going to do about preparedness for the next stuff? What are you going to do about you name it? As opposed to the other side's all bad people. I will leave you with this, and then I don't know if, if uh, you, like I said, you probably heard enough, Ray. You don't want any questions. Uh, but if you do, I'll, in, I'll endeavor to offend whoever. Um, what, come hell or high water, by God, we're getting our 30 minutes worth. I got it. Let me just say this, and some of you have heard me say this before. These jobs that people are asking you to give them the responsibility for performing are important jobs. And an election is, is a personnel session, in my view. It's a personnel session. Are, are we going to hire this girl or this guy to do this job? And depending on what the office is, it's like you're on probation for whatever the, the, your term is, and then the next time we'll go through whether to keep you or not. Okay. So if you look at it that way, let me ask you this. Have any of you ever heard about a job interview where somebody who has applied for the job comes in and says, listen, the reason you ought to hire me is because everybody else who's applied for the job sucks. I mean, you might as well laugh, but, but it's, I mean, serious. Like, vote for me because my opponent sucks. Wow. Well, that's all I needed to know. It's the whole, it's not an election. It's a who got, who got voted against. We've got to invent a new name for that. How about, and there was, I heard a little bit of that today. Yay. How about, here's why I think I could do the best job for you. Here's what I think the biggest issues are facing the person who's going to represent you for the next two years, four years, six years, whatever it is. How about that? And you say, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. How the heck did you ever get elected? I don't know. But that's kind of what we've been doing. And oh, by the way, it costs a lot less to run a campaign when you're saying, here's why I can do a good job for you, instead of I got to blanket everybody else on the other side with, Everybody else sucks. So think about that as we run up to sign-ups, and then after June, say, you want the state to change directions? You need a new team, and we need to support those folks that the primary voters have said are the folks we want to go forward and, and, and try to cross that finish line so that we can move things in, in a different direction. Thank you. He isn't getting off this easy. It'll be 30 minutes of questions. But before we start that, there's a couple of people. Bo Hamilton just got appointed Region 1, Region 2 Field Director for Nevada GOP. The other is Karen Conrad. She's the one that signed you in and really the brains behind Bill Conrad. And... She has, if you need any real estate business, she's an excellent realtor. The other thing is Martin is in the back with the book. It's normally $14 here today. It's only 10 bucks. So get your money out. Start buying books. Anyway, with that on mind, where Bill is, where the microphone, you have to go one at a time to ask Mark question. And I said the word question. If you start going into a diatribe, I'll cut you off. It's question only. I'll Congressman, if it's okay, I'd like to start with the first question. Fire away. So we asked the candidates today as they train, what do you think the biggest differences between Democrats and Republicans are in philosophy? Well, I, 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 the, the short answer is this. Uh, some people are driven entirely by a political agenda. And, and, and others are, are driven by what's the issue and how do we solve it. And now you say, what did he just say? It, it's like, I mean, turn the news on when you go home. Oh, 
let's talk about infrastructure and spending a bunch of money on whatever. Now, you got to define infrastructure. It's like, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. What happened to, I mean, if it's a crisis and it's negative, then it's like we're pivoting to our agenda. Our agenda, our agenda. Afghanistan wasn't on the agenda other than, oh, we want to say we're the ones who finally got out. Oops, lack of planning. Oops, lack of execution. And I won't go down that road because I don't want to be accused of being a hypocrite and preaching to the choir. The difference is, one is absolute, total fealty to an agenda that has nothing to do with the welfare of, of the state or the country. And that's the other one. Why don't you do something? It's like, what, you want me to be like them? And it's like, listen, maybe, maybe they're right. But I'm not going to be like that. And so I, the challenge I would put to candidates is, listen, tell people how you're going to make it better. Um, I mean, we can all beat up in, on, on Democrats in this thing, but it's like, and they'll all beat up in ours. It's like, that doesn't accomplish anything. Tell them how you're going to make it better and why you're the person to do it. Next. Two quick comments and two easy questions. One, heads need to roll for Afghanistan. Yeah. Two, you need to get rid of uh, Kissinger and Cheney, gone from the Republican yeah. caucus. You don't need to comment. Just, uh, okay, yeah. my two quick... Well, well b but you're absolutely right in terms of, l listen, um, th there's a whole bunch of people. I, I mean, um, I served, not in the Middle East, too old, um, but my daughter did, and I'm very proud of the, all the people. It's like, hey, whose kids went over there? Because when your kids go over there as a parent, tell, uh, it's, it's, anyhow, God bless them all. But, uh, Mad Dog Mattis, Secretary of Defense for Donald Trump. I don't recall exactly what the, but anyhow, it got to a point where, where General Mattis didn't agree with the Commander-in-Chief. So what did he do? He said, hey, the Commander-in-Chief deserves somebody who supports his policies, and, and he deserves that, and so I, I want him to have that. What's going on there right now in terms of, how do you sit there with multiple stars on your shoulder and that stuff and go, hey, but really, I, I've just become an automatron, talking, saying nothing sort of thing. And, and listen, I'm a respectful guy. They I was to, just a captain. It's like, they need to talk. be fired, plain they, and they, simple. No, they should have they resigned. Yeah. Let's talk about honor and duty. You should have resigned. My simple questions, these are really easy. I never see you on C-SPAN. What committees are you on? Because I watch, I'm a C-SPAN junkie. It puts me to sleep. And wait, just I'll sit down. And the second question is, why aren't you a member of the Freedom Caucus? Because that's where the fighters are. Well, actually, it's not where the fighters are because these guys are my best friends. They are absolutely fighters. But it's like when you talk about Mick Mulvaney, founding member, you talk about uh, Mark Meadows, you talk about Jim Jordan, who we're trying to get here, very close with them. But quite frankly, in D.C. these days, if you want some autonomy... They're doing a great job of the fighters. And by the way, if you want somebody who's like going to get on TV as much as possible, we don't say no to anybody. But you know the other thing I don't spend a single tax dollar on having my staff do? Please get me on somebody's TV show. You ask us, we're there with bells on, we never say no. But the other one is, well, I, I mean, if the Appropriations Committee means anything to you, um, and if this last appropriation site, by the way, I'm going to vote against all the bills because they've got a whole bunch of whatever, but basically, everything we wanted in there for real infrastructure for Nevada, for real stuff that we needed money for, public safety, radios, equipment, stuff like that, we got it all in. And you know why we did? Because we identify the problem, we find out what the rules are, and we got it all in. But the bottom line to that is this. I'm a believer, and these are words that everybody will understand. There's an old saying, I think it's attributed to Ben Franklin. Well done is better than well said. Now, I think I can said with anybody, but guess what? We're going to rely and continue to rely, as long as the voters say that's okay, to do well done is better than well said. And I, I want to do a tip of, of my hat to my staff, because that appropriations record, which, by the way, was stronger than many senior Republicans and Democrats, is the fact that we're... What are the rules? What are the criteria? Make sure that we're complying with that. Talk with your constituents to make sure that those requests are blah, blah, blah. And so, um, yay, Ben Franklin. 
Hi, my name is Joe McElhenney. Uh, there were a group of uh, congressmen and women out in front of the Capitol steps a few days ago uh, talking about Afghanistan and how poorly uh, the operation went. Were you one of those congressmen? No, because it would have, would have required spending uh, taxpayer dollars to fly cross-country over and back on my member's representation allowance for something that was quite frankly spontaneous. We reached out to the leader's office, said, you got anything organized, we'll be there. But you know what? Um, quite frankly, there were plenty there. They delivered the message. And I'll be honest with you, go for vets, quite frankly, are the ones who should be in the front and center. They don't need some 63-year-old Reagan-era active duty captain in there saying that too. I, I don't think the message didn't get delivered. But once again, you've got to look, you've got to use your brain, whatever, just like, oh, I got to go to D.C., we got half a Tahoe burning down, so nobody's going to keep an eye on the Forest Service because they don't work for anybody other than federal. Or, oh, by the way, we've got a few other things going on here, but let's put it all on hold because, by the way, when you go to D.C., that's two days before you do anything. That's a day there and a day back. So you can say, well, what kind of priority was that? It's like, well, you know what? I've served. My daughter served on two West Packs in the Middle East. And so the fact that I wasn't standing on the steps with those guys, it means no disrespect or anything else like that. The job is more than talking. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So what were you doing with the Forest Service? How were you interacting with them? Well, we're saying, well, you want me to get down in the weeds? Here you go. First of all, how come Nevada Fire Protection District chiefs aren't being consulted? It may not be burning in Nevada yet, but we've been living with the smoke all, mm, all summer. summer and... So I want to know who made that decision, whether it was somebody in Boise, whether it was somebody at Humboldt Toyabe, whether it was somebody in Southwest Pacific Region. Those are all phrases that might let you know we've done our homework. Then I want to know why none of the Nevada people were consulted. Did you talk to the Division of Forestry? Did you talk to East Fort Protection Fire Protection District? That's Foothill Road in Douglas County on down. How about Tahoe Douglas Fire Protection District? Does anybody know who that chief is? Since it's in the basin and Vernon and nobody's talked to him, this stuff where you wait for a jurisdiction to start burning before you start talking to them has to stop now. And it has, by the way. And you say, well, how come you know that? We learned some lessons with uh, Tamarack on that stuff. And, and by the way, as a guy who grew up in a home a long time ago where, where the primary breadwinner was a wildland fire protection guy for the states called the fire management officer. So when you talk about it, are, are the NDF helicopters flying? How come the guard helicopters are flying and yours aren't? So, I mean, there's a ton of things. Where are you going to stage, because they were staging at the South Tahoe Airport, where are you going to stage if the fire comes through there? You know, you can't go to Douglas High like you did for Tamarack, because guess what? They're in school until the next COVID teachers union thing fires up. <laughs> so, I mean, it's all that sort of stuff. Oh, and then, by the way, in the middle of that, while those guys are on the steps, we're also fielding lists from Las Vegas, not that I'm a guy who cares where lines are, that, that are scores of people who are still in Afghanistan that we're trying to basically get in the State Department system. That's right, with our eight people. That's fine. I'm not complaining. If that's the challenge, then we'll do it. But there's a few other things going on besides going back there and stating, and I'm not being critical, but it's like, anybody here thinks Afghanistan was okay? Hell, even the Democrats don't. So if you judge our work by the fact that you should have been standing on those steps instead of this, and that's before you get to, oh, well, let me see, there's the border. Then there's also the energy thing in terms of trying to make sure that the pipeline still sends jet fuel to Reno, because that's an interstate thing. So, you know, I mean, no disrespect, but quite frankly, many people think that the job, this job, is just about voting. It's about a third of it. There's about a third oversight, and then there's about a third casework, if everything's in perfect balance. So those are some of the other things. And if you'd like to extend my thing, I can give you a whole report off the top of my head about what else we've been doing. Thank no, you for your interest. I'm, I'm happy to hear that, the things that were going on behind the scenes because I haven't heard anything about it. So thank you. Well, and, and listen, please don't take disrespect. Well done is better than well said. Right now, I'll just tell you right now, my priority is dealing with these things. And so if somebody comes and say, hey, what the hell were you doing over Labor Day? It's like, fair question, and if I don't have an answer, well, you know, I'm left-handed, and I'm not a very good golfer, and there's not a lot of people out with the smoke, so I thought, it, then you should kill me for that. You absolutely should. But I'll just tell you this, and I think I have, so I'll quit repeating myself. 
I judge the assets that I have control of and my performance by what we do and how responsive we are. And, and not that we're not perfect. And we've got, you know, people like, hey, I didn't hear back from you. It's like, well, if I find out about it, you hear back. But it, it's like that's the priority first. Um, and, and I'll just be honest with you. I'm not a big social media guy because, quite frankly, I mean, you, you guys all know better. Oh, so, so I remember doing a thing for, for a young man years ago in the Middle East who passed away. He had gone through the ROTC program at Reed High. And the professor of military science reached out to us and said, hey, would you do a thing for us? We're creating a little memorial for him. Yeah, we will. Guess what? Somebody got on the Internet and said, how dare you use the guy's death as, as for your political gain? Okay. And, and you're like, I'm not even going to waste my time telling this guy that it was pursuant to request and, and, and whatever. And, and I'm not complaining. I'm just saying that's, that is the operational atmosphere that, and there's 435 right. off. That's the operational atmosphere that we operate in for a lot. Not that there hasn't been a lot of great support, but it's one of those things where it's like, we're going to take care of the stuff that needs taken care of first. That's the priority. And worry about who gets credit for it later. Next. I just for a second want to interrupt that it's getting close to one. However, there's a lot of people who have questions for you. And if Tell you guys them they'll do short questions, I'll do short answers and you'll no, be on No, no. If if you guys don't mind, we're gonna run a little longer. I usually am right on the dot. We're gonna run a little longer if you don't mind. Please stay. If you have to leave, we'll understand. But Okay, next question. Please state your name and what town you live in. Hi, Mark. Hi. My name is Lorraine Cognac, and I live in Sparks. The question I have for you, you talked about us getting behind whoever wins the primary, and I agree with that. <clears throat> but my question to you is, once the Republicans are elected and they get to their job, from your perspective, how many of them work together? How many of them stand up together once they get there when we need them to be a team? Yeah. Um, well, let's go forward hypothetically since the, the outfit that I'm affiliated with is the House of Representatives. So there will be, assuming that there's good news in November of next year, very shortly afterwards, there will be, it's like, okay, so who's going to be the speaker? Who's going to be the majority leader? Who's going to be the whip? And, and, and let me tell you, because these questions have come up before. It's like, how the heck did we end up with Paul Ryan? And it's like, well, well tell me who I should have voted for. It's a function of, you got to have some people that are basically there. Now, listen, Kevin McCarthy has been good to me as a Nevada representative, okay? But, but I'll also say, quite frankly... It's like there were opportunities because we can't convene the House as the majority. And even during the pro forma sessions, which they hold about one a week for introducing bills, if we go in and try to take that over, they can adjourn it right then, whether you've done your thing or not. There's a hell of a lot of power in being the speaker in that deal. But having said that, it starts with, so who's going to be your leader? And, and so, you know, people look at different things. How much money did you raise and all that other sort of stuff. That'll all go into the mix. But quite frankly, I think starting from the sixth on, the Republican leadership in D.C., and they're difficult times, but, but, but I'm just saying, I think there could have been stronger cohesiveness on it. But, but then for the second part is, is this. Listen, the fact that I am here as an elected Republican as the, in the federal delegation going, how the hell come I don't ever hear anything about you or whatever? It's like, guess what? You think, uh, you think Susie Lee's going to come up here and do this meeting, Ray? I, I mean, she'd probably be on time if she did, but anyhow. Um, so, so anyhow, I'll, I'll just say this. And the way I used to say it in the olden days was, it's much easier to spank your own kids than it is to spank the neighbor's kids. And right now... The neighbor's kids are the ones who are running the neighborhood. And so, um, but, but I'll just tell you this from having done this for a while, 
even though there are times when you're like, hey, there's some people who are upset about whatever, it's like, even in those times, it's like, well, let's talk about it and let's do whatever um, and go that way. It's like, the other side doesn't care. Listen, they don't want us back there. They don't, the Speaker of the House right now doesn't want her own members back there, much less us. And you say, well, why? They want to get together in a room much smaller than this, decide what they want to do, and then call everybody back and say, okay, we need your vote for this. I got to tell you right now, it's kind of an easy time because you're sitting here looking at this stuff going, I, I don't need to do, I don't need to do protracted extended research. This is all bovine scat. Um, I, I mean, they're making it easy for you. You know, it's like, well, here's all your stuff in the appropriations bills, and we're going to pass them. And it's like, well, yeah, that's great, and thanks, and, and by the way, that's a nice compliment, but, but we can't vote for it. Three and a half trillion dollars worth of whatever? And, and so it's like, but anyhow, I, I think that's the culture in the Republicans, I still think, is a very real sense of responsibility to constituents, voters, whatever, because not everybody's a voter. You know, there's kids' issues, there's whatever. And I think that's still the culture for the most part. But, but let me tell you what, once you sense somebody's getting away from it, it's like, hey, it's really about me, then I'll leave it to your discretion to do what you think is appropriate. Yes? Uh, hello, Congressman Amaday. My name is Terry Morris, and I am a um, uh, Nevada voter who is resident in Ireland. Uh, so I just have a couple of comments and then one question. Sure. Um, so uh, I, th I think you're doing, um, you're working uh, in a very difficult, very partisan, highly, highly charged environment. And so I just want to wish you the best. Um, the other thing is that uh, my mother, who is Ambassador May Herbert, she is uh, president of the International Goodwill Ambassadors in a Circle, and she's also an International Goodwill Ambassador for the state of Nevada. It's actually really important for her, although she has been to several Republican events, and uh, she has been a big support for the community and for the state of Nevada. It's really important to her that she stays and remains nonpartisan. Uh, so my question is, um, <laughs> would you accept a contribution um, for your campaign? <laughs> Softball question. <laughs> that's, a, that's a trick question. I know that. Well, yeah. Thank you, um, and, and, and tell your mom I said hi, I haven't seen her in a while. Oh, there she is, thank you. Is it ticking or, thank you. That's, that's a first, that's a first, thank you very, very much. Here, Stacy. I get it out of my hands as quick as possible so it doesn't end up in my glove box for a year like one of them did. Anyhow, yes. Hi, my name's uh, Lisa DeHart, I'm from Sparks. And I want to say, I appreciate every time I contact your office, how responsive you guys are. If I call or email, I appreciate that. And uh, my question was, I just feel like as a party, um, we could really help attract people if we got more involved with things like environmental issues. And the biggest one I think that is so obvious that both sides could agree on is like the plastic in the oceans. And I just wondered, is there any kind of thing coming down, like maybe tax incentives for companies to stop using plastic single use and maybe use glass again or paper products? Um, well, first of all, what we can do is if you'll let Stacy know um, how to get a hold of you, you're probably in our system. I don't want you to think that we got your phones tapped or anything. <laughs> you're probably in our system if you've contacted us. But what we can do is, is we can say, hey, here's all the stuff that's out there right now in terms of pending legislation or rulemaking by, by the various whatevers to, to deal with for instance, plastic yeah. um, and, and that sort of stuff. So we can bring you up to speed on that. And then, you know, uh, I'll just say this, because this is one of my complaints ab about the, the culture of cliche and talking point. All of those of you in this room who hate the environment, please raise your hands. No, we don't. <laughs> because Republicans hate the environment. So I'm going to ask you one more time, and you better tell the truth this time. Raise your hands if you hate Clean air, clean water, clean, clean dirt, clean anything. Oh, and animals. If you hate animals, too. Okay, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Quit piling on. 
So what, what I'm telling you, and I appreciate you, it's like, listen, nobody's against the environment. Nobody's against the environment. Oh, you Republicans, blah, blah, blah. It's like, Jesus, Mary and Joseph. So contrary to what you're led to believe by the talking point Olympians, it's like, hey, I, I mean, come on. Hey, you know what we haven't had for a while is, is a good oil slick. Where can we find an oil <laughs> slick? You know, where we can grease up some ducks and they can do Dawn commercial wear. It's like nobody dislikes the environment. And it is possible to use resources responsibly. Let me give you a Tom McClintock quote that's particularly poignant as we sit here in western Nevada in the Truckee Meadows. And that is this. At a Tahoe symposium five years ago, six years ago, or whatever, Tom has the other side of the state line. He, he has ta the, the, the California side of Tahoe. And his district's got other stuff. But anyhow, Tom gets up there because some people get a little nervous. when, And, and he's a Republican. Uh, they get a little nervous when, when Tom talks at environmental things, especially the Tahoe thing. But it's like, listen, he does his homework. Um, I, I don't think he cheap shots people. He doesn't whatever. But, but here's what he says at it, where you go, you sit there and you listen. You go, he says, listen, the wood's coming out of the forest one way or another. <laughs> And, 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 you know, my audition, I kind of chuckled, and then you think about it, you go, that's 100% right. It's either coming out in the form of smoke, or it's coming out in some sort of managed fashion where you're making things kind of like they were before the Comstock logging when you didn't have everything coming back at the same time and 100-foot and high walls of fuel with a bunch at the bottom, too. And so, I mean, that, and that's a Republican who, God, I think he hates baby seals even. The wood is coming out of the forest one way or another. And so I think there's plenty of opportunity. I mean, we've worked on, uh, 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 on, on the whole carbon issue, but it's like we want science. We want something that makes basically, so this is something we can manage. It's not just, hey, we're going with one side over the other, whatever. Let's start talking about. Because there was a proposal that said, hey, we want to tax carbon and we want to redistribute the income to low-income people. And it's like, if you want to do a low income, income supplement thing, fine. But, but if you're going to tax carbon, before we even get into the discussion, tell me how you're going to use that to do R&D to make whatever the heck, you know. I, I mean, have some connection there. So anyhow, um, we'll look forward to, did, did I say something to make Stacy mad? Is she gone? Wouldn't be the first time. Uh, well, thank you. Yeah, that's right. So anyhow, we'll get in touch with you and, and make sure you know what's going on in terms of what's on the, on the boards right now. Next. Next in line. Mark, try to hold it as brief as you can. Good advice. I'll take it. <laughs> Hi, my name is George Taylor from Sparks. So during the first two years of, the pre of this presidency, no, really there'll be two to three million legal immigrants coming in because of laws passed by Congress and apparently around five million at the current rate of people coming in whom we don't even know who they are, not following laws passed by Congress. I know you're only one in 535. Can you, do, can you do anything? Can your side do anything? Is it up to us to pound the phones to our two state senators who are part of the controlling majority? Well, I mean, kind of all of the above. I heard what you said, Ray. Here's the deal. The failure to react to immigration is a bipartisan failure in the Congress. And I've been criticized by Republicans for signing some discharge petitions. It's like, let us vote. Quit. You know, I've got this saying, everything that gets uber politicized gets ruined. Education, health care, uh, immigration. It's, it's like, listen, I'll tell you, we've spent a lot of time on immigration. Immigration is not hard to solve. It's going pretty and good, pretty long basically keep the concept of borders and, you know, the president was on the right track. Many people are like, listen, the president was looking for a solution. And, and you know, if, if Laura Ingram didn't agree with it, I know some of you are probably her cousin or something like that. She'd get on there and she'd just scream amnesty and be like, oh, my God. It's like, you know, have enough courage to, to weather the storm to do something because – and I'm not Barack Obama's defender, he did a bunch of executive orders because Congress didn't fulfill its con constitutional duty. And that's when Republicans and Democrats, the Democrats like saying, 
we feel your pain, vote for us. And the Republicans were like, not, not a single one, and we're going to, and it's like, hey, deal with the problem, learning the lessons from the past. So th the last part of that is, is absolutely call your people up and just go, uh, j j I mean, the Constitution says the Congress will establish a system of naturalization. I, and, and I'm within a word or two of an exact quote of that line. And naturalization, even for a guy like me, is like, hey, that's immigration. And so it's like, what's the hard part? Take the vote. Take the vote. Then you can say, hey, Amade, you voted on blah, blah, blah. It's like, you got me there, but here's why I did. You may, it, but I mean, that's how the discussion should be. But absolutely call them up. And, and by the way, you can quote me. It's like, let me tell you what. John Boehner dodged it, Paul Ryan dodged it, um, and, and the D's think that they've got a great deal saying, let them all in because they're all going to vote for us. And, and actually, when you sit there and you go, actually, their values line up with Republican, you know. <laughs> they're spiritual, they're self-reliant, they're, for the most part, the normal ones. And so you're just sitting there going, why don't we solve this problem? There are strong Hispanic Republican groups that, that, that are all of the above for our state. So anyhow, hope that's responsive within race. We'll do the last three. Okay. The last three. I just want to give kudos really quickly Speak on up. that. Speak sure. up. Sure. I want to give kudos really quickly on that. Just so you know, two years ago we had an immigration issue, and I had to ask Amade to step in on a California issue where the California Democrats refused to help. So just so you know, this man is thankless so many different ways to, since Tuesday. But... I'm up here actually to just say thank you for everything you're doing right now and for everything that you've been doing silently and putting up with silently. <laughs> My question for you is, you've been dancing around this um, many different ways and sort of throwing some punches in the air, but I really want you to nail it. You've been actively involved with the Tahoe region conversations since you first got into office because you just happen to be one of the smartest people on the environment that I know of. Can you give some details of what you and McClintock and even Heller was doing way back when, I don't know, six, eight, 10, 12 years ago about cleaning up that area so this moment wouldn't happen? And where did it go wrong? Well, well it, 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 listen, fuels management is not a dirty word. You know, it's not like, well, they're going to roll in the logging crews and kill all the, you know, it's like, it's not a dirty word. You have to know that, that, that when, be, before Smokey the Bear came along, God took care of fuels management. And for instance, in the Tahoe Basin, we know from the forensic folks, it's like, listen, th there were a half a dozen fires burning in the Tahoe Basin at any one time D during th those seasons. They were low intensity, they kind of burned, they cleaned up the duff along the whatever, you know, maybe a few trees or whatever, but it kept the fuels managed so that you didn't get 100 foot high walls of flame during drought periods and trees exploding and, and, and all the stuff that we deal with now, fuel moistures in the low teens and stuff like that, it kind of took care of itself. And then we started, and, and I'm not, I'm just saying this is historical, then we started going, up, oh, put it out, put it out, put it out. And then we followed it up with, and listen, this was before ACORN. Go back and look at the newspapers. Don't clean up your pine needles. Don't get rid of those pine cones. You can't cut a single tree down, even if it's leaning against another tree or your house. Those are all bad things. And it's like, so then you get, what do you get? You get an absolute fuels convention. And so, as you're talking about, you want to keep the lake clear? Well, guess what? The biggest threat to lake clarity is wildland fire. And so you look at those drainages now where it's like, we got to keep it out of there. It's like, so here's what you can do, or, or here's what the solution is. It's, it's yard work, ladies and gentlemen, and you're not going to clean up a yard that's hundreds of thousands of acres in a season or two, but you've got to start. You've got to identify, for instance, one of the things we were doing was during a Sierra Pacific briefing, it's like, well, if this substation goes out, they lose power to that. It's like, what's the defensible space around What's the fuels management you've done around? Have you given the fire people a chance to defend that substation? Or what about this transmission line that's going into Round Hill that, that if that transmission line burns through, all around Hill goes dark? Have you been doing your right-of-way maintenance on it? Because those things have been in your rates for decades. 
that also applies to PG&E, by the way. Anyhow, so w when you talk about all that, so it's like, it's like, I'll just tell you this, Jennifer. I'm going to start saying, um, hey, guess what? The resource is infrastructure, too. You heard me say it earlier. The resource is infrastructure, too. Just like you got to maintain that bridge, and you got to maintain that highway, and you got to maintain that drainage thing, you have to start maintaining the resource that surrounds every one of your communities. And so while it's Tahoe's, you know, everybody's like, okay, that's fine. It's like, well, there you go. So it's like, find the old burn scars. We know where they are. Figure out where your communities are, are vulnerable that have no line around them at all before the fire starts. Once the fire's burning, it's about evacuations and trying to stay the heck out of the way, as we are painfully aware of. So th that's what needs to be done is it's like you need to start valuing resource infrastructure the same as, you know, you can't just, I like looking at it and I hope it doesn't burn. It will burn. And by the way, that's, that's the lightning thing. So it's not even like, you know, be careful with your cigarette butts or for you high rollers, your cigar butts. Um, you, you know, it, it's like, hey, um, you can be perfect in that, but you're going to lose when the lightning step comes. So that's, that's what I think the, the answer is. You've you got to reduce the fuel load. The Thank you for sharing that. And just Did from all of us, hopefully of everybody table. here agrees with me that we all should, number one, increase our prayers for his health, his well-being, and his leadership. And also, more importantly, continue everything you're doing because we know that we don't know everything that's going on back here, but we know you do, and we need to trust your ability to do it. So... Thank you, and we'll continue to pray for you. Thank you for your kind words. And, and, and if you want to pray for my health, pray for my mental health, as you can tell from this display today. All right, yeah. next question yeah. by Patty Miller. Yes. I was going to introduce myself. Patty Miller from Reno. Hi, Congressman. Patty. Hi. Um, my question has to do with, well, I'm going to make a comment into a question. I believe that as long as we have bills that are 2,500 plus pages, where you can hide all of the whatever you called it, BS, uh, we are never going to have an effective House and Senate that is transparent and accountable. Well, So if you agree, why can't we propose a bill that we future legislation can only be, pick a number, 50 pages at a reasonable font, 12, 12 size font or something, because this is ridiculous. In well, my opinion. Well, and, and, and you're not wrong. Let me tell you what, what thousands of page bills are. They're the function of lack of transparency and lack of leadership. Because when we talk about appropriations, on the Senate, there's an outfit called the Senate Finance Committee that does that. You know how many public meetings they've had since I've been on appropriations? Markups where you can sit there. You can watch ours. And I'll give Rosa DeLauro credit. I mean, at least we've still kept it transparent. You can see what the amendments were that were offered, and you can and, and they'll you can demand a roll call vote, and you see who's for that amendment and against it. We've had them on wild horses, we've had them on all sorts of things, everything that the federal government spends money on. And whether I like it or not, because nowadays we get outvoted on all of them, almost um, the Senate does none of that. So when you say, well, how are we spending money, and, and what's the deal with it? I'll tell you what's coming up next, the 30th of September. That's the end of the fiscal year. Oh my God, you have to vote for an omnibus spending bill, which is thousands of pages, or the government's gonna shut down, or you gotta vote for a continuing resolution, which freezes all spending at the existing levels, which these days may be the best defense we got, <coughs> but, but they'll pass it on, on partisan lines. But, but anyhow, you'll, you'll see that whole fiasco where it's like, th there you go. And, and so I, let me give you one other word, leadership. Leadership allows that to happen or encourages that to happen on both sides of the aisle. And, it's, and nothing is more disrespectful to the appropriations process or even other stuff. You know, we did a lands bill that, that, that tried to expand NAS Fallon. And so there were other lands issues, so we put them all in. All fully heard, all the same thing. And it's like, well, but, but, but you can't let that sink or swim on its own. They want to throw that into the National Defense Authorization Act, which basically, and so your instincts are absolutely right. The larger the bill, and usually means very little transparency, and invariably, 
it's like, oh, did you know there was something in there basically saying that the desert tortoise is a threat to casino chips in Las Vegas, and so we need to kill them all as soon as we can? You know, you just go, how the hell did that get in? It's like, well, guess what? When you don't let your committee members see the bill and you don't let them have a hearing on it, this is what you get. And, and it's been going on for long enough to where it's like, I mean, God bless you. Um, uh, okay, Ray, I got it. Next. Okay, Paul Larson from Reno. And first of all, I'd like to commend you for paying attention to forest management because I had friends in Paradise, California, and it wasn't pretty. And we don't want Lake Tahoe to be the next bloodbath. But um, um, getting on to the, the other subject about doing rather than, than talking, I commend you for not prioritizing a photo op and for doing the work of the people. But I will say that there is a resolution circulating in Congress for a, a formal uh, request for Biden, uh, Secretary of, of Defense, Austin and Chief of Staff Milley to resign effective immediately, and it wouldn't take very long to sign off on that. I know the suicide hotlines are lighting up like a Christmas tree from the veteran community. I know I'm a vet, you're a vet. Like Ask your question. Me. My question is, will I sign will on you to sign that? it yes or no? Um, well, yes, but we do have this rule, we read them all first. Just yes. to make sure that Don Young hasn't put a bridge to nowhere in it, of and I'm course. sure he hasn't. But, but, but we do stick close to that. The other one is we may already be on it because there's a couple that we're on that, that, that are on that way. But if you want to leave, did the police come get Stacy? Oh, was it something I said? So, so anyhow, make sure we know how to get a hold of you, and we'll keep you in the loop on what the various ones are and the specific one you're talking about. Yes, because it should be a very brief resolution. Yeah. Simply, will you resign? Well, but we've talked about a couple in the last week, and so we're on a few of them already. I okay. just don't want to tell you it's that one yeah. without making sure. But something anyway, at least as a statement for the veteran community of, of the sense, there needs to be accountability. Well, well I don't, you, you know, I, I'll just say this, and this is just me speculating, but it's like I think you would find out of the 435 people in, in the House of Representatives, um, that I'm sure the vast majority share that opinion. Yes, it should um, be bipartisan. Th they're, not give, they're not being given an opportunity to express that on the other side because we're going to have a thing on Build Back Better um, pursuant to the speaker's priorities, and, and, and there you go. So, you. yep, you bet. Thank you, guys. You've been very generous with your time. I want to really thank Mark. He did an excellent job, and people have been very courteous. However, before you leave, please come up and take pictures of the fallen soldiers' table. They did an excellent job. Also, the candidates are here that will answer questions. They have literature. And don't forget to get the great book with Martin back here. Hi guys, uh, one last thing for the Nevada Republican Party. I have a petition right here against vaccine mandates in the state of Nevada. So if you guys feel like signing that and telling Sisolak that we don't want mandatory vaccines, I'm always right here. Thanks guys, appreciate it. Thank you for coming. The next meeting is going to be a Commonwealth meeting, Nevada Commonwealth, at the end of October.